Please mark in your Bibles Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14. Mark chapter 9, beginning at verse 14. Um, we are in this space where we're coming down off this mountain where uh, Peter, John, and James just saw a transfiguration take place. And they saw Elijah and Moses hanging with Jesus, who is wrapped in clothing that's white as lightning, and he's shining. And they're having this amazing hilltop, mountaintop experience with Jesus. And Peter, in his impulsivity, he has some things to say and some appeals to make and some suggestions to make on that mountain. And when he sees Elijah and Moses and Jesus and they're on this mountaintop, Peter's like, hey, let's build some tents so that we can, we can set up camp and, and that we can keep this for a while. And I don't know what Peter was, was thinking about so much as it felt like he was kind of saying, let's set up like this retreat center, you know, where we could just be with Jesus and be with Elijah and be with Moses up on this mountain and we don't ever have to come down. We don't have, ever have to come down from this place. It, when we look at the path of the disciples and with Peter specifically, Mark, Mark is quick to point out the, um, the, the highs and the lows of Peter specifically. I don't know what that's all about, but maybe when Peter was articulating the Gospels to Mark and he was transcribing them, Peter had a great self-awareness of how life was in this journey with Jesus. See, Peter didn't build himself up to be a type of hero. Um, Peter was um, zealous. He was out in front. He was a leader. He was take charge. He was charismatic. He was, he was very impulsive. He was energetic. He, he wanted to be the first one out of the boat. He wanted to be the first one on land. He wanted to be the first one with Jesus. He wanted to be sitting there. He wanted to be, you know, the tops. He wanted to be the leader. This is the kind of guy he was. But when we look at the gospel narrative and we see this narrative that was articulated by Peter to Mark, we can see that Peter explained as much his flaws as he did his victories. And I say that because we have this amazing instance that we've read where, where Peter sees Christ for who he is. He has this opened eyes experience and he, and he sees Jesus and Jesus says, who do people say that I am? Peter answers rightly. He says, you are the Messiah. You are the son of God. And, and Jesus is like, man, blessed are you, Peter. You've answered correctly for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father who was in heaven revealed this to you. And it's almost like as if it's in the same breath where Jesus then off this mountaintop experience is talking about what then the Messiah must do. All right, right, you said I'm the Messiah. Now this is what the Messiah is going to have to go through in order to fulfill the purposes of God in his life. To, to, to do the work of his father. It's going to look like suffering. It's going to look like taking a cross. And Peter's looking at Jesus. He's like, no, 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 wait, 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 Messiah. Like, could you imagine pressing pause on the Messiah? Could, could you imagine pressing pause on, on the Son of God? Like, the Son of God is teaching you. You've just acknowledged this is who he is. And then when he begins to say what he must do, you're like, no, wait, pause, time out. This isn't what you were called to do. You weren't called to suffer. You were called to save. This wasn't what your life, our journey, this isn't what the path was supposed to look like. And you remember what Jesus says to Peter? He says, get behind me, Satan. Wow. Mountaintop experience, you're the Messiah. Jesus says, the Father has given this to you, blessed are you, and then in the same breath, get behind me, Satan. The P Jesus is calling Peter Satan <laughs> for, for wanting to throw him from his ministry calling. I don't know about you, but for me, I would feel like that would be like coming from a high place to a very low place. That's a plummet to go from blessed to Satan, <laughs> right? That's a high and a low. If you ever grew up in a family or you are a family, hey, let's talk about this week's highs. Let's talk about highs and lows. We've done that before in our family, highs and lows. What was the highlight of your week? Now, what was the low of your week? If Peter was sitting at a table, he's like, well, you know, I was hanging out with Jesus and my high was I'm blessed because the father revealed to me that he's the Messiah. But my low was the same Messiah that I acknowledged as Messiah called me Satan. <laughs> That's a low. And then we go right back up to this high place where Jesus doesn't 
just because he brings that correction, he doesn't discount Peter from what he's called to do. He knows that Peter's going to screw up. He knows that Peter's going to get it wrong. And, and this is the learning path that Jesus has such patience with his disciples. And yet, as we go through these verses and these chapters, we can see how Jesus is becoming a bit agitated with the lack of belief from his disciples and from the crowds. That there is this lack of belief that he's struggling with. We've seen Jesus in spaces where he's given a deep sigh, sigh of frustration. How long? How long? A deep sigh of you unbelievers, as we're going to see, this unbelieving generation, this how long? And, and Jesus is in this place where he's beginning to become, uh, uh, not, not lamenting, but he's going to be wrestling with the unbelief that is apparent all around him. And so Peter, from this high, low, back to high place, we're back at the transfiguration, and now we're coming down the back of this mountain as we approach the last six chapters or so of Mark um, and we are going to see how they descend from this mountain where this transfiguration happens, and then we're in another somewhat of a low point. But I'm happy to say it doesn't stay there. We don't stay in the, in the low point, right? Um, how many of you know that we need the lows as much as we need the highs when it comes to faith? Like, you know, when we go in those low valley seasons, and they're prolonged, um, that is the space where things, if you let it and you allow the Spirit of God to give you perspective, those are the places where the most refinement comes. The refinement doesn't happen typically on those mountaintop places. The refinement takes place in those valley places, and then when you're on those mountaintop places, you know where your glory belongs, where your worship belongs. You figure that out in the valley place. You find that out and are formed in that valley place, right? The refiner's fire, the, the, the place of purification, like in that low place where all you have is the Lord and his spirit. Then as you go and you're back in that mountaintop place, like that's where you know my glory, your glory belongs here through me because it's you who were working in me all through this valley place. And you didn't give up on me. And I know where the glory belongs. It doesn't belong on me. It belongs to you. The glory belongs to you and you alone. In verse 14, we pick up, and it says this. It's on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you. It says this. When they came to the other disciples. This is when they came down off the mountain. Okay, when they came down. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 14. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So they come down off this mountain from this place where Peter wanted to, to build a retreat center. They hear the voice of God. This is my son. I love him. Do what he says. You can read that verbatim. This is my son. I love him. Do what he says. All right. In the verse uh, verses shortly before this. And so Peter and, and uh, Jesus and James and John are coming down the mountain and they came to the other disciples and they saw a large crowd allowed around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. They come from this place of being in the presence of Jesus to a great commotion. There's a commotion down here. And as soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought to you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. And he foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Dear Lord, we praise you and we thank you for your word. Let it come as you will it, according to your righteousness and wisdom, we pray. Teach us, Lord. Amen. Amen. 
So this is a narrative that, that spans more than what we've read. And I thought it very important for us to take this one narrative in two pieces, to focus on two different things. And so we'll have a part one today, unbelief and a young boy. Part one, and unbelief and a young boy, part two next week. And we'll clear out this, uh, this pericope of scripture. But I thought it very important for us to focus um, on these uh, f- first few ch- uh, verses of this chapter from 14 to 19, where we can really dive into the condition, not of the boy so much, because I think a lot of us can, can just skip right to the condition that is so glaring. It's a condition that is so glaring. We have a boy who is demon-possessed. He's gnashing his teeth. He's throw, being thrown to the ground. He's foaming at the mouth. He's convulsing. He's contorting his body. And as the father explains in the latter chapters, not o- or in the latter verses, not only is he doing this, but whenever there's water, the demon compels him to throw himself into the water to be drowned or to throw himself into a fire to be burned if there's fire. Uh, And so this is a boy who is under the control of demonic forces. And this father is at his wit's end. That is the glaring uh, truth. That is that's what's staring us in the face and screaming at the top of its lungs uh, when we enter in to this scripture. But before we can ever even address the condition of this boy, we also we must uh, uh, address the condition of the crowd. We must con- address the condition of the Pharisees who are present and the disciples who are present, the ones who were at the bottom of the mountain as James, Peter, and John were at the, the transfiguration. And, and we must look at the condition of James, Peter, and John, and we must look at the heart of Jesus in this whole uh, narrative because Those are the key components to what is at play that lead up to the healing of the boy. And so we can't just skip to the condition and skip to the healing. We got to look at what's taking place in and around this situation. You know, what struck me is that when Jesus was coming down the mountain to uh, further enact and progress his ministry with his disciples. They just had this mountaintop experience. Peter, James, and John are coming down. They come to the foot of the mountain, and what do they do? They find a crowd of people arguing, a crowd of people arguing. And in this crowd, there's there's common people, there's disciples, and there's Pharisees. And you have very different ideas taking place. And as we are given um, knowledge into what is going on and what is at the center of this argument, we can see that the argument is taking place as a result of a boy being in their midst who is demon-possessed. And as we read further, we can see how the disciples didn't have the power or the ability to bring healing to the boy. And so we can assume that at the base of this mountain, while this child is in pain and he is uh, dealing with this crazy uh, possession that is causing him torment and pain, there are these crowds of people and these different sections of people who are arguing about how that problem can be solved. So there is an issue and there is a problem and there's a whole lot of different ideas on why something may work and something else might not and why we should leave it alone and why we shouldn't and what is going on. Is the sin generational? Is it because he sinned or his parents sinned or what happened in his history or is it a sickness? Is it some sort of psychological issue? Is it biological? Is it spiritual? Is it is it something where maybe the parents didn't bring their offerings to the temple or maybe we just don't understand where the power of God truly comes from and there might be doubt in the disciples and there might be righteousness in the Pharisees and there might just be um, an ignorance among the crowd and they have all sorts of different ideas well maybe we could ask this magician or maybe we can use this witchcraft or maybe we're asking the wrong God to bring healings and so there's so many different ideas that would be circling and causing arguments when it comes to addressing the disposition 
that is being fueled by demonic activity and terrorizing this young boy. There is so much noise and commotion that would be taking place surrounding the condition of this child. And they're at the base of a mountain, and they're talking about all these things that circle and circle and circle. And that one person begins to speak to another. What did he say? What did the priest say? Oh, what did the, uh, the scribe say? Well, they know the law. What does it say about demon possession? Oh, but these disciples, they've, they've been walking with Jesus. And, you know, these disciples, they were sent out two by two. And they were casting out demons. And they were doing healings. And they, they were able to free, set people free. And so maybe we should talk to them. And why didn't that work? And I thought they were followers of this Jesus who was known to be healing all throughout the land. And so then the, the, the speech and the talk and the circles and the ideas and the sections and the different factions begin to grow and now everybody has a good idea about the best way to approach this problem and the problem is is that no matter how much they argue no matter how much they think they know no matter how well versed they believe they are the truth is it's not being solved The problem is not being solved. It continues to writhe. It continues to be tormented. It continues to foam at the mouth. It continues to contort its body. And now, while all this is going on, people are just arguing. They're arguing while this is going on. They're arguing. It's so relevant, I think, for our culture. We have so many problems in society. And nobody has the power to solve any of them. And you know what we're doing? Arguing. We're constantly arguing. Pointing fingers. You're wrong. I'm right. This is how we solve it. This is how it should be. This, and we have these great build-up ideas, and there are so many divisions happening. Even now, guys, we're in an election year, and it's just going to come to that. It's going to be as loud as ever. It already is loud. And we have everyone, choose a side. What side are you on? How are we going to solve it? And all we're doing is arguing as the problems continue to writhe, continue to foam, continue to fester. And for us, we've got to maintain that the only answer and the only hope we have for humanity and any of our problems came down from a mountain of transfiguration. And his name was Jesus, who said, I have to suffer so that I can save those who I, who I love, so I can heal those whom I love. And these people who are arguing about that thing, academia versus experience, fruitless arguments, uh, different ideas on approaches and gods and uh, uh, history and tradition and culture and all these ideas that are germinating and festering. And I can almost see that as loud and contentious things become, the worse this boy's condition becomes. It, it's like in concert. The more these people argue and the louder it gets, the more this kid suffers and the more intense his writhing becomes. It's not in the word, but I could see it happening because to me, that's just a reasonable assumption because chaos feeds chaos. Calamity feeds calamity. Selfishness feeds selfishness. Darkness feeds darkness. And so these people who want to promote the best idea on how this issue is solved are the ones who Jesus, in frustration, calls unbelieving. You might have great ideas, but do you believe? You might have great track record, but in this situation, do you believe? You you might have seen results before, and they could have been connected to faith or not or whatever, 
but was specific to this moment. Jesus is calling out unbelief, which means that the ruminating arguments and fruitless talk that was taking place was all rooted in unbelief and was also manifesting as nothing more than selfishness, self-centeredness. I want to be heard. I want to be listened to. I have the best idea. And it really has nothing to do with Jesus. And so uh, where we can take note in this is we can see where unbelief is self-centered. Jesus calls them out of unbelief. You unbelieving generation, how long? Golly, how long? What are you arguing about? What are you arguing about? It's, it's so palpable, these arguments. And I cannot, I cannot identify a smidge of faith in any of these arguments, a smidge of, of kingdom in any of these arguments. I can't identify a smidge of belief in your arguments that is going to bring any real healing to this chaotic situation, this painful situation, this situation of suffering, this helpless situation. I cannot identify an iota of faith in any one of your arguments because they all have to do with you and they have nothing to do with me. Unbelief is self-centered. You know that when we attempt to share Jesus with somebody or when somebody is dealing with unbelief, a lack of faith, it really comes down to, and as we've preached in several weeks past um, consecutively is that unbelief and the rejection of the gospel all comes down to the love of self. I love myself too much to place it in the hands of Jesus. I love my sin too much to turn from it and to follow Jesus. I love my convictions too much to believe that Jesus has a better way. I, I love what I've decided is good to, to follow a Jesus who says my way is better. Uh, it it's all comes down to a love of self. And we don't want to give that up for the sake of experiencing and receiving the more that Jesus has for us as we settle for the thing that we think makes us us. Where we've hung our laurels on me, my ideas, my convictions, my accomplishments. If, if it means that I have to give up these laurels, these self-promotions, if it means that I have to give these things up, I am not so sure I can do it. And Jesus in his mandate that those who would follow him would deny themselves, pick up their cross, and follow demands that our laurels are placed at the feet of Jesus and we pick up his righteousness and his purpose for our life. And we invite him into the situations that are chaotic and rough and terrible and we say, Jesus, look, I'm all out of ideas. Only you can work in this. Only you can settle this. Only you can heal this. Only you can bring about your perfect and righteous result. Only you can conform this into your image. Only you. And so I lay down my laurels because I know I have nothing when it comes to the approach and the modus and the mechanism that's needed to address this outside of faith and belief. So we will see the father in the latter verses of this chapter. I believe. Help me in my unbelief. We could pray that. Lord, we believe. We believe. But help us in our unbelief. 
when we don't trust you enough to invite you in and think that we need to trust ourselves and what we have in solving what is unsolvable outside of your grace and your intercession. One other thing that I will uh, point out is not only is unbelief self-centered, but when we have uh, self-centered people thinking about themselves and what they have to offer more than what God has to offer, what we see is a disunity. We see a disruption, a uh, disintegration, if you will. And that means to bring apart, not to bring it together, but to bring apart, dissolve, dis-ease disruption, dismiss, I don't know, other dis words. So where we see unbelief, we see a lot of dissing going on. That's an old 90s word, hip-hop slang. Yo, you dissing me? Don't be dissing. Don't be dissing. So here's what happens. Unbelief is not only self-centered, but unbelief is quarrelsome. It's quarrelsome. It's qu- when I act outside of God's will in a tense situation or when I'm in the company of people who I don't agree with and I'm not praying or I'm not seeking God's wisdom and I'm just going to share ideas and whatever, I know it doesn't work to bring anything together. It's not bringing unity at all in any way. I'm too broken. Uh, I'm too sinful and too prideful that even when I believe that I'm acting in humility, I really am just doing it for myself. Unbelief is quarrelsome. Unbelief is argumentative. Unbelief is self-seeking. It's disunifying because what you're trying to do is you're trying to subjectively argue for your own belief system. And if it's not rooted objectively on the truth and the word of God, and if it's not sown and threaded by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, what hope does anybody have for any kind of unity if we don't share in the same blood, if we don't share in the same faith, if we're not driven and rooted in the same word? What what hope for unity, we've, we've got a threefold, at minimum, unifying uh, dynamic that, that allows us as the church to be unified and on one accord. And it, it's all centered on the faith that we share, in the Lord that we share, in the baptism that we share, in the blood that we share. It, it's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. It, we, we share in this faith and we share in one Holy Spirit and we're rooted in one word of God. How can we fail? And, and, and yet we have so many sects of division and denomination even in the church. Because at some point we dismiss the main things and the plain things And we start to get so overtaken by the peripherals and the preferences of how we believe church should be. And we allow that to take root and drive us in our own directions and bring people along. But if we are truly planted in God's word, if we do share in his spirit and we are baptized in his name and we are a part of this one church under the lordship of Jesus Christ, this is where unity comes. This is where unity lives. This is where we see that the only answer that we have to our condition of brokenness and what is going wrong in this world, the only answer that we have is Jesus. Well, if we start there, then maybe there may be some hope for some healing and restoration as a people, as a church, as a society. We call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He is our Messiah. So unbelief is quarrelsome. You don't have to look far to see how many fights and uh, fruitless discussions and debates are happening um, devoid of God's presence in our society. You don't have to look look wrong. Just turn on Facebook. You'll see it in a minute. You'll see it in a minute. But belief, as we see, 
Belief is Christ-centered. Our belief, our faith needs to be centered on the person of Jesus Christ and the work that he has done. That is where our faith begins. That is the modus out of everything that we do, every hope that we have, every answer that we could possibly uh, come to terms with. It is all rooted in the person of Jesus and the finished work of Christ on the cross, which also propels us into our calling, into our purpose. It first and foremost begins with the victory we have in Christ and the lordship that he is, the lordship that he is to us, the Lord that he is to us. He is Lord. So every day, every decision, my feet hit the ground. Jesus, you are Lord. (laughs) Jesus, you are Lord. Move me and call me into my purpose today. Show me what is your will for me today. Jesus, you are Lord. Show me what is your will for me today. Jesus, you are Lord. Now we go into our workplace. Jesus, you are Lord. Show me what your will is for me today. We go into uh, the house of a relative out of obligation. It's not easy. Jesus, you are Lord. Show me what your will is for me today. We go into a quarrelsome uh, work dynamic where it's really difficult to get along with our co-peer employees. (sighs) Jesus, you are Lord. Show me what your will is for me today. Jesus, you are Lord. Show me what your will is for me today. We have to take care of a loved one. Jesus, you are Lord. Show me what your will is for me today. Jesus, you are Lord. It is a centered faith that cuts through commotion and says that this may present a disruption that only the Lord has an answer for. It cuts through the commotion and enters into a dynamic that says this is a disruption that only the Lord has an answer for. And so I say, show me your will. Show me, Lord. The belief, the faith is Christ-centered, and we enter into that, and we enter into those situations, and not just as a proclamation, Jesus, you are Lord, show me what your will is for me today, but that is a prayer. We enter into it with prayer. Jesus will point out, only way to solve this is by prayer. Well, if he says that, what did they forget to do? Pray. We'll talk about it next week. If, if Jesus says the only way this comes out is by prayer, it means that through all the arguments and all the noise and all the commotion and all the self-righteousness and all the proper approaches, there was one thing they were lacking, prayer. They forgot who was in charge. They forgot who had all authority, all power. They forgot. You got great sermons, guys. But if you don't have prayer, they're fruitless. You've got great work ethic. But if you don't have prayer, it's fruitless. It's in vain. You've got great ideas. But if you don't have prayer, this ain't going to work. Not to my glory. And so he points out, this only comes out by prayer. And the faith, he's calling them into faith. What happens when we enter in, Lord, or Jesus, you are Lord. Show me your will in this place. What is your will here for me? What we're doing is we're passing the laurels. We're passing the responsibility We're handing over the authority for Jesus to work. And when we do that, we also hand over our own preferences and our own predispositions, but also our own pride gets passed over. And so what we say in that is that we are not elevating any characterization of the flesh or pedestals of any self-reliance or determination that what I'm attempting to do and the success that I found 
has everything to do with me and very little to do with God. Uh, we, we, we are passing that over, that this had everything to do with me and very little, if nothing, to do with God. We are passing that over. When we pray, Lord, Jesus, show me the will that you have for me in this space. Present your will. Let it be known that I might be obedient to, do, to you. We are passing up every opportunity that we may have to make it about us. And then we, in doing so, make it all about him. And then we say, this has everything to do with God and very little to do with me. It is the cry of John the Baptist who heralded the Christ's coming and saying, he must increase as I decrease. I make myself small in this situation because my heart magnifies the Lord an acknowledgement of his presence and his ability to work in this place. Very much about him, very little about me. And so the baton of responsibility goes and is placed into the Father's hands, and we let go and say, God, have your way. How can I help? How can I be you in this? And as long as we argue, and as long as we look out for ourselves, it has no chance to ever happen. It is fueled through the reverence of the Father, the following of the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is incited by his word. We put aside the fruitless arguments, as it says in James, and we seek the will of the Father. And we rely on the power of the Holy Spirit and the insight of the word, and we say, God, help me be you. Help me be you. Help me be you in this. It's faith. The people see Jesus coming down off this mountain. We haven't even really come to the, the boy himself yet or the father. But as Jesus comes down off the mountain, all this argument happens. People have an epiphany, this revelation, apocalypsis type thing. And they recognize Jesus. And, and some uh, theologians and scholars would say that as Jesus was coming down off the hill of the transfiguration, he continued to shine like Moses who came down with the Ten Commandments and whose face was shining as he came down because he had been in the presence of God. And so there, there's this indication that Jesus may have still been shining as he came down from the mountain of transfiguration. The people saw that it was Jesus and they ran to Jesus. They ran to him in recognizing him. This is what belief does. This is what faith does. Faith sees, recognizes, and runs to Jesus. Faith sees, recognizes, and runs to Jesus. It, we may be in these chaotic situations. We may be caught up in arguments. But man, I love it when I'm in this, these, these crazy contentious arguments with people. And I've got one brother or sister who says, can we just press pause and let's just pray. Let, let's give this to God. Can, can we just pause and let's just pause and I'm going to pray right now. It is Danielle. I'm just going to pray right now. Danielle, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be in this, I don't know what to do. What are we going to do with this next step? These kids, what's going to happen with the, you know, and, and, and Danielle is like, okay, let's pause because I'm going to pray on that right now. We see in the midst of the calamity where we're so caught up in this, this kind of, circulating cyclical uh, what about this and this agitation and this idea and this anxiety and I'm going to talk about this and now I'm caught up but they said and he said and hypothetical and this rumor and that and we, and, and we get all caught up but then you have somebody who sees and acknowledges and runs to Jesus he, he sees and recognizes and can cut from the noise and this fruitless stuff that is only compounding and creating more craziness can cut through that and say, hold up, I see, I see Jesus, 
we recognize as Jesus as Lord. So guess what? I don't know about y'all, but I'm going to run to Jesus. You going to run with me? We see and we recognize and we run to Jesus with all of that anxiety, with, with all of that, those, those uh, distractions, with all that we run to Jesus, we place them at the feet of Jesus. We see, we recognize, and we run to Jesus. And we leave that behind. And we put it at the feet of Jesus. And we, we just, there's, there's this, there's this preemptive attack and this preemptive posture that we can take on these disruptions, on this chaos, on this, this, these conditions that we're dealing with, um, th- these distractions. There is a preemptive, there's a preemptive posture that we can have. And it's reiterated in the prayer, Jesus, you are Lord. What is your will for me today? The prayer gives us the ability to remember who our Lord is when we're being taken by the hand of the chaos. The chaos is taking us by the hand, but I wasn't created to follow chaos. I was created to follow Jesus. And so we have to prepare our hearts. You know, oftentimes when um, we are most anxious and most given into anxiety, it's when we've forgotten preemptively planning, fail to plan, plan to fail. When we've forgotten in our planning, the first part of our agenda, when we've forgotten who our Lord is, who's in control, it's Jesus. And so we get caught up and we forgot Jesus. And now what am I doing? I'm writhing and I'm foaming at the mouth. I'm contort, my face is all contorted. I'm in pain. Why? Because I'm caught up and people are arguing And they got all sorts of things to say and nothing seems to make sense. And then all of a sudden I'm brought into my right mind because thank God Danielle comes along. She says, hey, we're going to pray on this. I'm going to pray right now. We're going right to Jesus with this. I don't know about you, but I put my armor on this morning. I don't know about you. Shoo. And you say, oh, thank God for bringing me into my right mind. Thank you for reminding me who my Lord is. Thank you for reminding me that this thing is only solved by prayer. And you know what I love is that that act right there is the personification of what is happening in this narrative that took place 2,000 years ago. Because I'm in problems and I'm in chaos, and I'm in disorder, and life is disrupting, and I'm distracted, and I'm consumed, and it's it's beginning to feel like I'm powerless. And then Danielle, keep using you as an example, Danielle says, no, we're going to pray about this. We're going to stop and pray right now. Remember the words of Jesus. You unbelieving generation, how long, how long before you get it? How long should I put up with you? You unbelieving, Luke, Luke, you unbelieving person. You unbelieving, sweet, (sighs) unbelieving child who just, you want to do so good, but you just keep forgetting. You just, I love you so much. You just, can you, but can you just stop getting sucked in? How long, how long are you going to let this get the best of you? How long are you going to give yourselves the ideas? And I'm in this, and this is ruminating, and it's churning, and I don't have any answers, and I'm doubting, and all this stuff, and I'm contorting, and I'm tight, and the anxiety, and I just, and I'm gnashing my teeth. Anybody? And then the one who knows the answer comes and says, we're going to Jesus. The personification of what happens in this, how long, how long, how long, you unbeliever, how long, next word, bring the boy to me. Bring the boy to me. Going to Jesus, seeing, recognizing, 
and going to Jesus, running to Jesus, is the personification, the demonstration of what happened 2,000 years ago. How long must you unbelieve before you bring it to me? How long? Bring it to me. Br bring the child to me. Bring the issue to me. Bring the disruption to me. Bring the problem to me. How long? You gonna wrestle with this? How long must you rely on yourself? How much pain must you feel like you need to go through? How long? Bring it to me. It, how long do we need to be in this condition before we decide it belongs to Jesus? It belongs to Jesus. Bring it to me. The prayer that a mother had for her son for years and years and years and years, who did not quit praying for her son, brought her son to Jesus, created a testimony out of that, not knowing when the answer would be prayed or it would be answered not knowing, but continued to contend for her son. And then by his grace, according to his good timing, the grace of God pulls him out of the darkness and the chaos and the calamity and the possession that he was under and saves his life. My testimony, mama didn't quit praying. It's the widow of Nain in the book of Luke. The funeral procession was happening. It was leaving the city. Jesus met the funeral procession at the gate. A widow had just lost her son. He was about to be buried. Jesus Christ raises him from the dead. And in the scripture it says, and he gave him back to his mother. Bring it to Jesus. It belongs to Jesus. How long? How long? So we say, I'm done relying on myself. Oh, yeah, I've got responsibility, but I'm done thinking I can do it alone. So I'm giving it to you. It belongs to you. It's out of my hands. It's not mine. It's yours. Faith, belief brings blank to Jesus. It's a repetitive theme through this entire narrative Repetitive theme. Mark chapter 1, they bring Peter's mother-in-law to Jesus. Mark chapter 2, they bring the paralyzed man to Jesus. Mark chapter 5, Jairus brings the issue of his daughter. Mark chapter uh, 5, the woman brings her issue of blood to Jesus. Mark chapter 7, the Seraphonician brings the issue of her daughter. Mark chapter 7, the friends bring the deaf and mute man to Jesus. Mark chapter 8, the friends bring the blind man to Jesus. Mark chapter 9, the father brings his demon-possessed son to the feet of Jesus. Repetitive theme. You've got something that is destroying or contorting or trying to damage or destroy the image of God here, something that's out of whack, something that isn't happening in line with God's heart, something that is out of order, bring it to Jesus. We bring it to Jesus because Jesus is the only one who restores his image on that which the enemy attempts to disrupt, distort, deform, or destroy. Jesus is our only hope to restore order and healing to that which the enemy is attempting to destroy. He's the only one. And so my question for us would be, what do we have that needs to be brought to Jesus? What is the thing that we love that we need to bring to Jesus? What is the thing that, that we might hate that we need to bring to Jesus? What is the thing that we are afraid to let go of that we need to bring to Jesus? What is the place where we feel like we're falling short every day that we just, without Jesus, you got no chance, no hope? What is the thing Jesus says so lovingly to the one voice that calls out in the crowd, my son is demon-possessed and your disciples cannot help him and I love how Jesus says, bring the boy to me. So when you're thinking, name it, it's the boy. And what's the boy's name? 
what's the boy's name? It, uh, what pain is it? What, what dysfunction is it? What's the boy's name? It, it, it's got many names. You know its name. And the question is, are we bringing it to Jesus? Laying it at his feet. Bring that boy to me. Bring it to me. So out of our own ideas, our own power, our own strengths, or lack thereof, we know that there is no true solving of the thing that we're wrestling with. But Jesus promises us that if we will bring it to him and we lay it at his feet, that he will take it up and he will be with us in the trouble and by his spirit and according to his father's perfect plan, he will bring exactly what we need in that given moment, in that given place. And it's not always in line with what we want, but I guarantee you, it'll be exactly what we need. Because God does such incredible work refining us in the valley as much as he does on the mountain. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us, and then um, we'll have our final benediction. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for this morning. Lord, help us um, today, today, to bring you the boy. <laughs> help us to bring you the thing that is troubling us, the thing that we've been wrestling with, the thing that seems out of control, the thing that's causing dis-ease. Help us bring you that which we know is not in line with your will. It's, it takes a lot for us to be willing to do that. But Lord, I pray that you would give us the faith, the faith that it takes to surrender those things to you and to know that without you, there is no relief. There is no answer. We can't do it on our own. We don't have what it takes. So Lord, help us to invite you in and to set things straight. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please rise and we'll have a final benediction. Our family verse comes from Isaiah 60, chapter 1. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Love this verse. And it says this, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen among you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Rise City Church, I pray that you arise and shine this week as you begin your day with Lord Jesus, you are Lord. What is your will for me today? I pray that you would invite Jesus into every dynamic of your life, knowing he is the only one who can bring healing and perfect peace to any given situation. Be blessed and be Christ this week. Amen.